the Olympic Committee announced the standard for the 2020 Olympics, and they actually changed it to the most difficult standard it has ever been. And you now, they cut the field of women they were taking in half to only 80. And they said, in order to qualify, you need to run a time of 2.29.30 in the marathon, which is over 15 minutes faster than any other year in the Olympics. And just to understand what that is, that means running a 541 minute mile for 26.2 miles. So at that point, um, like my husband, who'd always been my biggest supporter, was basically just like, BD, you're amazing, but like you might as well give up. Like you're not hitting that even in your lifetime. And I said, you know, if Hashem brought me this far, it was to me, it was so clear, like it was all from Hashem, like he could bring me that far. Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. And I'm very excited to share with you this conversation that I had with the Mrs. the one and only Mrs. B.D. Deitch. So back in the day, it was common to hear about people that had to make sacrifices for what they believed in. You know, when after the war in America, people, even before the war, people and Shabbos, from people in Shabbos. If you weren't going to come in and stay late on Friday and work on Saturday, you're going to get fired. And people had to make the sacrifice of saying, I keep Shabbos, and I'm not going to sacrifice that. And unfortunately, some people couldn't keep to it. It doesn't really happen so much these days. But we're living in 2022, and it kind of still does happen. And you'll hear in this conversation how it happened to Mrs. Deitch and how she overcame that desire, I don't say to break Shabbos, but desire to follow her dreams and actually to figure out truly what's really the most important thing in her life. So I'm very excited to, to have this conversation. Also, if you're watching it, you get to see the beautiful sunset of Eretz Yisrael. If you're listening to it, maybe you'll hear the sounds of like crickets, but in the background, not because it's awkward at all, just because I think there were actual crickets there. And this episode is in memory of Shimon David ben Yaakov Shleima, and also in memory of Miriam Sarah Bas Yaakov Moshe. And you will hear about my very good friends at Feldheim who are sponsoring this episode because they want to tell you about their awesome Tanoim series. You're going to hear a lot more about it and the awesome deal that you could get by buying their books after you listen to this episode. Here is my conversation, kind of in Eretz Yisrael, with B.D. Deitch. We can all use some inspiration to help us overcome the obstacles we encounter in our lives. Get ready for thrilling conversations about struggle and triumph with those in pursuit of making a positive impact in this world. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Okay, here I am. It feels like I'm in Israel um, with Bidi Deutsch. Bidi, where, where are you exactly? I live in Neve Michael. It's a moshav that's like seven minutes outside of Ramat Beit Shemesh. Uh, I've been living here the past three years. And before that, I lived in Harnof. And I just feel so grateful to live here. I love living in Israel, but I love our moshav. It's so beautiful and amazing for running. And I just, yeah, I can feel the breeze now. So nice to be sitting outside at night in the summer. My kids are hopefully sleeping. <laughs> yeah, from the looks of it, from the looks of it, it looks it looks really beautiful over there. But take me back. Where did you grow up, and did you anticipate that you'd end up in Israel? So I grew up um, mostly in Passaic, New Jersey. Um, I actually lived in Chicago before that, and I was born in the D.C. area. Um, and yes, I always wanted to live in Israel. My parents started taking us for Shalosh Regalim from when I was like in 10th grade and before that we would go for sukkahs and like from the moment I came to Israel I was just like I'm living here like this is my home this is where I want to be and when I came to seminary I pretty much told my mom like uh you should say goodbye because like I'm not coming home <laughs> that's amazing that's amazing so when you were younger I think I saw this online you weren't really a runner does that make sense 
Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Passaic. It's a from community. We didn't have a lot of options in sports for girls. I did love sports. Like, I was athletic, and I did gymnastics until I was 12. But there were no all-girls gymnastics groups when I was growing up. So after that, I stopped. And then I did, like, pick up basketball, even though I'm barely five feet. But that was, like, what the girls played every <laughs> Sunday night. And I used to just run back and forth across the court. So... I knew I loved moving my body and I knew I enjoyed being active, but like never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined that I'd get to run every single day, twice a day for my job. Yeah, it's uh, definitely a very interesting job. So so at what point did, did running become more serious in your life? Well, I only started running um, six years ago. Basically... I was an out-of-shape mom of four. I gave birth to Baruch Hashem, four kids in six years. I was, like, barely surviving every day, you know, working a full-time job and taking care of my family. And I felt so, like, out of shape. Like, I just felt like I needed to make a change in my life. And um, I told my husband that I was signing up for a marathon at the end of that summer. And my husband actually did not, like blink an eye. He was super supportive. He's, you know, I had been supporting him, um, biking for the previous years, like the beginning of our, since we got married, he always loved to go cycling and I was really supportive about it. So when I told him like, that's it, I'm running a marathon. Um, he was right behind me and I, I trained for my first marathon and I have not stopped running since, but it did not get to the level of professionalism that it is at now until three years ago. So, so at what point, what, what happened that you're like, okay, now I'm a professional runner? Well, um, basically what happened is I had a miraculous race where um, I can share that story in detail or, <laughs> and, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah tell it, tell it to okay, us. Okay, so um, I, I actually was the fastest, I won the Jerusalem Marathon, like I was the fastest Israeli woman in 2018. And after that, I joined a running group because I knew I enjoyed running and I wanted to focus a little bit more seriously on my training. And so our running group, we all trained for the Tavaria National Championship Marathon. So basically, it's the national championship race in Israel. And I remember, you know, when I joined the group, in my head, I was like, well, I'm a newbie. Like, there's no way I'm going to be winning this race. But like, my goal was top 10. But uh, about a week before the race, my coach was like giving all of us our race day plans. She pretty much told me that she thought I had a great, ch I, like I was going to be the winner. She knew all the women who were signed up for the race. She was like on the running scene for years in Israel. She knew what they, ca they were capable of and she knew what I had in me. And she was like, you got this. Um, I always joke. She was like, all you need to do is run a 626 minute mile for 26.2 miles. Um, you can try it for like one mile, see how it feels. But <laughs> she's like, if you do that, you have your 248 marathon. That was my goal. And I was like going into the race to win. Um, first half of the race was like going, by, like went perfectly. And as I was getting to the halfway point of the race, I literally looked over and saw on the other side of the course already coming back well ahead of me, another woman. And I remember I was just like in shock. I was so mad. I was like, who's this lady? Where did she come from? Like I had been so sure that I was winning this national championship and I hadn't even seen her. She wasn't on the list of participants. So for a second I thought, okay, maybe she's not Israeli because and then it wouldn't matter. This is only the Israel national championship. But when I looked closer, I realized she was Israeli and I recognized she had run a 238 marathon this year. So she was like way faster than me. So at that point, I, you know, all odds are against me. But in my head, I said to myself, like something that had really gotten me through many of the hard workouts where I like wasn't at all sure if I'd be able to keep up with the pace. And I said, you know, if I realize that I am connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I have a Tzal Malakim inside of me and Hashem is infinite. Like there's no limit to what HaKadosh Baruch Hu could achieve. So by that same token, like I am connected to infinity. There's no limit to what I can achieve. And I made a choice. I said to myself in that moment, Hashem is with me every step of the way and anything is possible. And I, I like 
still can remember that moment. Like, it was so crazy. I decided, you know, that I have nothing to lose. The race is not over till it's over. And I'm going to pick up the pace. Now, my coach had actually literally warned me. She's like, if you try and go faster before the 20 mile mark in Hebrew, Iva Vailach. Like, do not do it, lady. And I remember as I was picking yeah. up the pace and going as fast as I can, like sprinting to catch up to this lady, her voice is in my head, like ringing. Oy va vay lach, what are you doing? Because like, you don't sprint for 13 miles. It's a half marathon they had to go. But I literally just kept repeating yeah. to myself, Hashem is with me every step of the way and anything is possible. Long story short, I caught up with this lady and after two minutes of me following her, um, she turned around to me and she said, Anigmura. I'm finished. Visit It's your race. Keep going. She literally told me to just keep running because she saw that I had more in me. And I ended up crossing the finish line of the marathon, the Tavarian National Championship race. I was the winner. Two nine, uh, I ran 2.42. And because of that time, which honestly, I had no idea it was significant. I thought that the Olympic standard was 2.45. But basically, for Israel, it had switched off in previous year in between 237 and 245. So like 242 was somewhere in the middle. They contacted me, the Israeli Olympic Committee called me and invited me to become a professional runner for Israel. So that is when I picked up my seriousness towards running and I accepted their offer after consulting with my Rav, which again, that was a whole nother, you know, he was incredibly encouraging. My Rav and mentor is Rabbi Kellerman. And he told me, you know, of course you should run for Israel. This is a koch that Hashem gave you. There is only one individual like you in the world, you know, created with your strengths. You need to use them to make a difference for the Jewish people. And so I accepted that opportunity and I have not looked back. It's just been an amazing journey. That's really, really incredible. And and I, I'm, I knew that like Hashem was in your life because I've seen your Instagram and your your uh, website, but it's just to hear that story of like Hashem's with me every step of the way, and even when you're like deciding, should this become a full time thing? Let me consult my Rav. You know, it's 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 really admirable that you're uh, really taking you know Hashem into your life to this point. Um, so at that point. At what point were you were you like had your eye on the Olympics? Is it after Israel reached out to you, or is that a, you know a whole nother division? No. So about a month before that race, I realized that I was within reach of the 2016 Olympic standard, which was 245. I I mean I thought. Now my coach actually told me like. She did not want me to, she did not think I should try and go for 245. She thought it was like a bit further than what I was capable of. At the end of the day, I ran 242. Um, but right three months later, the Olympic Committee announced the standard for the 2020 Olympics, and they actually changed it to the most difficult standard it has ever been. And you now, they cut the field of women they were taking in half to only 80. And they said, in order to qualify, you need to run a time of, to 29.30 in the marathon, which is over 15 minutes faster than any other year in the Olympics. And just to understand what that is, that means running a 5.41 minute mile for 26.2 miles. So at that point, um, like my husband, who'd always been my biggest supporter, was basically just like, BD, you're amazing, but like you might as well give up. Like you're not hitting that even in your lifetime. And I said, you know, if Hashem brought me this far, it was to me, it was so clear, like it was all from Hashem, like he could bring me that far. So I did not get discouraged. I just chose to pursue the Olympic qualifying standard, slightly different route, which is called the ranking way. And it's a bit more complicated. But if you get ranked in the top 80 women worldwide, then they were going to take you, even if you didn't have the guaranteed standard, you could still get in. So that was my goal. Things got very complicated because the date of the Tokyo 2020 marathon was moved for women, was moved to Shabbos. Not men, only women. <laughs> oh, Hashem loves me. <laughs> <laughs> so did you end up running on Shabbos? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. I would not, um, well, I guess nothing's ever, you can never assume anything, never take anything for granted. But as soon as they announced that, it was obviously clear to me I'm not running on Shabbos. No matter how many Israelis would tell me that we can find you a rabbi who will tell you it's okay. It's just running. It's possible. Running was my job. <laughs> it was something I don't I don't work on Shabbos. You know I'm not gonna no and 
it also felt clear to me that like maybe Hashem's entire mission for me was to say, even though I made it to like, you know, the highest level in sport, there's something more important and that's Shabbos. Um, the other thing is that, and I, I feel like this is also an important thing. I, I didn't for Tokyo 2020, um, because it got pushed off a whole nother year to 2021, I actually didn't manage to make it to the top 80. I ran my final race was like, I had one last shot. I knew anyways, I wasn't going to be able to run in the Olympics, no matter what they weren't willing to accommodate me. I reached out, I had lawyers, they were very not interested in doing anything for any type of religious whatever, but I tried to still hit the standard and I only, I came up short by two minutes. I ran a 231 marathon and it wasn't enough. So, you know, there's that also. And I feel like that's an important part because, you know, sometimes we're like afraid to say, to go all in on something or to take a risk or to say like, I tried my best, but I didn't make it. Like, it's almost like embarrassing to say you failed. And I embrace that part of my journey because I think you can never get to the depth of your potential and who you possibly could be if you're too afraid to try and fail. And every failure that we have is a necessary step to bringing us closer to who we can possibly become. You know, I see that in your personality because right before we started, you're like wearing these big headphones and you're saying how small headphones don't fit in your ear. You're like, I hate it. But you're like, okay, whatever. We're just going to do it. It's totally fine. Like it, it's... I guess that 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 idea then I guess in the big cases or the big case in your life when it makes a very big deal it seeps into those little times those little moments which makes up all the moments of of just pushing through and like just trying to do your best you know No I am definitely hardwired to be like resilient and you know I remember my 6th grade teacher said like things just roll off your shoulders and I think that is a very important strength in being uh, an athlete. It's part of what allows me to do my job so well. But also the challenges and failures I've gone through, I've had to remind myself to to also, you know, give myself space to to deal with a loss. So I think like there's you need the balance of both because um, I when you invest your whole heart in something, you can't just also say like, oh, it didn't really matter. Like. Of course it mattered. Of course it affected me. Of course it was really hard. But that doesn't mean that it's going to... If I give myself the proper space to absorb that, then I can also move forward with resilience and strength. There, it's, it's often awkward to brag about our accomplishments and, and uh, things like that. But I, I, I'm asking you to talk about some of the partners that you, that you work with, whether it's Adidas or Nike. I mean, these are brands that I've Grown up, I'm like literally wearing Nike sh shoes right now. But um, I, I see you're very well involved in, with Adidas. What, what's wh first of all, who are you involved with, or who have you been involved with, and uh, what is that like? <laughs> I, w I wish I could say better things. On, I'm going to be honest in that. So I did a campaign with Adidas in Israel, um, but basically Israel's market is very small for athletes and sport and. Unless you make it to like the really top, top world level, they are not signing you for any like financial contracts. They're only giving you gear. So like my relationship with Adidas, Nike, I'm not like at the level where I'm like an actually paid athlete. They give me gear here and there. They paid me to do the campaign. And I have to say like some things, it's not always about money. It's about like just what the mission and message that you, you want to bring to the world. And I have always felt like running is really just a, a vessel for me to share more of Hashem's light into the world. And, and w what Adidas saw in me was my uniqueness as a proudly religious, observant athlete who isn't afraid to stick, you know, stay strong and, and stay committed to her values. And that's what they sh chose to highlight on the billboard. So to me, that was just, you know, I never wanted to be famous I still kind of think it's weird and like I'm very happy to be that anonymous <laughs> runner that just does her thing I love what I do because I love it but I was grateful for the opportunity to be on a billboard just for women who care about sneas modesty all around the world to be able to say wow like yeah like look at she's she's sneas and she's a runner and we could do it too we could push ourselves we could pursue our dreams and passions and it doesn't mean we have to compromise on the values that are important to us that's really beautiful. A question for you. I, I mean, obviously, um, you know, running isn't simple and every single nuance makes a difference. 
what's would it would it would you be faster if you weren't dressing as modestly as you do yeah i definitely i thought about it a lot recently because <laughs> like i'm so close to that standard and i'm not there yet and, and and like i mean i think i'm capable of doing it i had a i had a few crazy races like getting corona in the middle of berlin but anyways but it's clear to me like if i took if i was wearing uh what every other runner is wearing I'd easily shave two minutes off my time, like no question. And I have run um, in, you know, clothing like that on the treadmill or whatever, when, you know, so I know what it feels like. I know how awesome it feels. Um, and I'm kind of not even like, <laughs> I'm not even embarrassed to say that because I don't think it's a bad thing to say, wow, a mitzvah is hard for me or and I don't even fully understand it sometimes, but I'm going to keep doing it because I care deeply about my relationship with Hashem. And this is what he's asking of me. And this is important to me. And so I find ways that feel person, like for me personally meaningful for why I am dressing, you know, sneezely, even though it's boiling hot, even though it's cutting off seconds of my time, even though it's not nearly as comfortable, you know, but I, I feel like it's a, it's a character trait. Like being modest is something that I want to embody and live with at all times. And when you're someone like an, when you're an athlete who works really hard and dedicates, you know, so much of your time and energy to getting faster, and then you have a great race, it's so easy to be like, oh, it was all my hard work that got me here. Like I worked hard and that's why I achieved this. And I think for me, when I dress modestly and I remind myself every single time I'm running, it's not me, it's Hashem. My strength is not coming from me. It's from him. So that's how I choose to view this mitzvah that can definitely be challenging you know your story gives me a lot of chizik because i i think growing up at least at least me i don't know if everyone was like this but at least the way the world and how things were portrayed was like you know you think of a god doll or whoever it is like yeah of course Rif Chaim, like he probably learned his entire life and and it was somewhat easy and and obviously we know you know as you get older like that's not the reality but you know i think there is a at least in this time with people sharing their stories and their struggles, it's, um, it really, for me or for kids, it's like, it's okay to struggle with, with certain ideas. As long as, you know, your head is on straight and you're working on yourself and you're trying to get better and, and you're, you're following like, like what you're doing, you're really following in the ways and you're saying, okay, how could Hashem gave me gifts? Hashem is also giving me challenges what's the best way to navigate this? And it's, for me, it's a breath of fresh air to hear everything you're saying. It, it really, truly is is being mechazik me. Yeah, I think definitely today people feel more comfortable um, being vulnerable and sharing their challenges. And we definitely see it's like, it's okay to not, you know, to have, to struggle. And I think it's also, to, you know, important to remember, like, if you are struggling, there is there's community and support and resources and mentors and teachers that can help you. And you, you, you're worth that investment. And and don't give up on yourself, you know, and reach out even to the people that can help you and ask the questions you need to ask. And like, don't be embarrassed of it, you know. And I think the first place for growth to happen is to admit that you are struggling with something. If you If you are too scared to admit that, you you won't really give yourself the op option of of f facing it right you know you might say oh it's too hard for me and then just abandon it altogether instead of trying to address what is hard and how can i you know make it easier for myself how can i learn more about it how can i figure out what it's going to which it, how to integrate it into my life in a way that feels manageable for me you know we'll be right back to this week's episode but first if you're watching this or listening, because I'll make some noise with it, you could see or hear in front of me, I have some of the greatest books for your children ever, the Tanaim series. This episode is brought to you by the Tanaim series, which is published by Feldheim. The Tanaim series takes you back to the time of the Mishnah, where you'll meet some of the greatest scholars and teachers in Klai Yisrael, like Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, Rabbi Nachum Ish Gamzu, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, Rabbi Meir Balanes, and more. So there's a total of 13 books available and eight more in production. So you're not running out of any stories yet. These books are amazing because they have great storytelling with a lively comic book format, creating a learning experience that will inform, delight, and inspire children of all ages. I have to be honest, I'm pretty upset 
not at them. I'm well, it is at them. I'm set of thought I'm that they only came out with this now. I love comic books growing up. I still love comic books. Nerdy fact about me. And I was blown away when I opened this up and I actually read it, one of them to my son Alexander. He's one and a half. I, I advise it for kids a little older than that, but still, it was, it, I'll be honest, I enjoyed it myself. It's a comic book like story of what's going on in the times of the Tanaim and different characters, well, say characters like they're not real, but they're totally real based on true Gemara facts and events. You can see at the end of the each book, they have the Makaros for each uh, story, where it comes from, any of the ideas, and and it, they're, they're amazing. I mean, obviously, each book is about a different person, and I kind of think like this is the, like, I can't have a podcast with Rabbi Hanita Mendoza, but you could kind of get to know who he is, what he stands for, and amazing stories from him. I can't really have a podcast with Rabbi Nachem Mishgamzu or Rabbi, Rabbi Gamliel of Yavne, uh, Rabbi Yochanan Ben Zakkai, Hillel Azakain. I meant, I, I can't even list all of them. There's so many of them. They're great. They're easy to read. They're great for kids of all ages, and they're great for adults. I, I, I'm not kidding. If, you're, if you don't have kids yet and you appreciate people from history, I highly recommend you get it. But we're not just telling you about it. We are connecting with Feldheim to give you guys the best deal. On any order of five or more Tanaim series books, you'll use the, ch the coupon code at checkout, LL20. Those are the letters LL and then the numbers 20, LL20. Don't know what 20 stands for, but who cares? Um, your life will be 20% better. Um, and they will give you 20% off. Well, maybe that's where the 20 comes from. I just figured it out. And you'll get free shipping. So order five bucks. Use the coupon code LL20. And you'll get 20% off plus free shipping. Or you could be like me and just order all of them. They're amazing. And they're coming out with more. And... Listen, you will get great content on Shabbos or during the week whenever you read this, and you'll also be helping me. You'll be helping this podcast survive, and we'll become able to do more episodes and do so much more with this show. So go ahead in the show notes, click on the link, and use the code LL20. Now, back to this week's episode. So, you know, right before we got on, you mentioned, you know, that talking about being vulnerable, that you, you are going through something now because you're injured. And, you know, when someone in, I guess, the, I say regular world, when you have a regular job, you can, like, hurt your leg, like, it's, I mean, it depends what job you have, but generally, if you're an accountant, it's, it's, it's annoying, but, and hopefully you get better. But for you, this is, like, this is what you do. Um, I guess, tell us about the injury and, and how it's uh, making things a little more complicated for you. Yeah, there is like, I could talk for an hour about this injury. It's all <laughs> I've been like thinking about and dealing with for the last four months. So I think the hardest part about the injury is that really I made a mistake to begin with. And so part of me is like really feel and it's forcing me to miss out on a huge opportunity. So basically, if we backtrack four months ago, I ran a serious marathon. It was like an all out effort. I was again trying to go for that world standard of 229.30. I came up short and ran only 231. I like improved my personal best by four seconds, which felt like nothing, even though everyone always says, I, I always say every second's progress. But in that moment, I was pretty devastated. And I asked my coach if I could run the Tel Aviv half marathon that Friday, basically five days later. And I feel like it was almost like I wanted to just make myself feel better because I knew I could easily win the Tel Aviv half marathon. It's fun to run, a, to run a race, you know, just for fun and win it. That's like, thank God how it is in, like, in Israel, the competition is not very um, serious. So... My coach said, if you feel okay on Wednesday, like I did a trial tempo run, he said, okay, you could do it. I felt good on Wednesday, great. And then what happened is on Thursday, I started to notice something in my leg, but I pushed it out of my mind. On Friday, I ran the whole race with some sort of pain and I thought I was fine. And there was so much adrenaline and energy and I had such a great time that obviously I felt okay. But then the second I stopped running, something was not okay. Now, when I went to like try and figure out what was wrong, you know, I went to my massage therapist and, you know, he did all this work, loosened me up. Like I figured at, at, at worst I'd be out for like two weeks a month. I never dreamed that 
four months later, right, this was in February, now we're almost in July, I would still be dealing with this. And the sad thing is that I tried so hard, I wanted to qualify for the world championships with that standard. And in the end, even though I didn't hit the time, I still qualified because I made it to the top 100 women in the world. I was ranked number 97. I never left that list. Wow. So I could have competed in Eugene, which was my ultimate goal. But I ended up, you know, obviously everything is Minha Shemaim, 100%. And this is what Hashem wants for me right now. But in a way, the fact that like, it's a humbling experience because it's just reminds me that there are consequences to your actions. I made a poor choice and I'm suffering the consequences. Now there are a million, many times this injury, it's, I have ITB syndrome. It's things that, it's something people, people easily get over in sometimes two weeks, a month. For some reason, mine is a lot more stubborn. That's not clear. So that's the where I can keep reminding myself, no, no, this is from Hashem. This is what, this is what he wants from you. And, and it's hard. I think that as an athlete, it's, we all know that it's an inevitable part of sport. But as, you know, I, when I started running in 2019, the world championships were on Shabbos, on Friday night for women. Again, in 2020, the Olympics were on Shabbos. They love doing it on Shabbos. <laughs> What's with Shabbos? It, no, it actually, it's crazy. It's not usually. These are like weird things. But all the races that the world championships was on, the half marathon world was on Shabbos. This race was the first race that I had that I qualified for that was not on Shabbos. And here I'm injured. And I don't know, it's just clear to me that, like, I have two options. I could be like, this sucks, I give up, and, like, pity, throw a pity party for myself for a month and f be miserable. But at the end of the day, like, I, running has always been the greatest source of joy for me. So why am I going to let the thing that brings me so much happiness make me upset. Like the thing that I control is my response and my reaction. And it's another some, you know, another obstacle, another challenge, but it's going to make me stronger. Like what I've chosen to look at is how can I, you know, use this opportunity to come out stronger mentally. And also even just working on my running form, there were weaknesses that I needed to fix. So when I come back, I've worked really hard now to change my running form, to strengthen certain parts of my body, and and to use this as a time for growth in that area and growth in my amuna. Like it's a test, and I have to constantly, you know. You think, okay, I came to the place of acceptance, and now it's going to be easier. But then there will be certain triggers. Like I see a picture of the whole Israeli team training in Italy, where I was supposed to be this summer, and my heart, you know, stings. Or I think about how badly I wanted to just be, you know, that Israeli woman running through the streets of Munich, like proudly, like religious. Here I am, 50 years later, you tried to kill us. There was a terrorist attack here in the city. 50 years ago, eight Israeli athletes were killed and here I am stronger than ever. But I know that there will, like I just remind myself, Hashem has something bit, bigger and better in store for you and, and, and keep strong and, and you know, embrace this opportunity as a as a chance for growth in other ways. That's such a powerful message. Um, on the lighter side, do you listen to anything when you run? Maybe maybe a podcast or two. I don't know. Um, a lot of running, I I do without listening to anything because I don't know. I just find like I need the chance to like just disconnect from the world. Um, definitely when you do workouts, you cannot listen to anything. Like you need to be really in tune with your mind. And then even on easy runs, I like the opportunity to like meditate or, or, or just be alone with my thoughts. I have five kids. So like people are talking to me all day, but, um, every so often I listen <laughs> to music. I do not, I don't listen to podcasts when I run, but I listen to them when I drive. I end up driving a lot. So like, I'm always listening to podcasts when I'm driving, but for some reason, it does not work for me when I'm running. Like I can't handle like someone chatting in my ear when I'm running. Like I don't want that. <laughs> right. I hear that. That's fair. Um, is there a, someone in history, if you could sit down with them for an hour and either talk to them or just get advice from them, who would it be? I feel like I've always heard people ask that question and I never um, thought about it myself, but it just like jumped into my mind that like I would love to like sit down with Esther Hamalka and just like talk to her about like her experience and her Amuna and just, you know, everything she went through. Like she's such an incredible, you know, role model for Jewish women to me in many ways. Yeah, she's a great example. I, I could see why you particularly would want to talk to her because like she's someone who like 
didn't want to be on the stage and like she was just like she had to do what she had to do and now the whole you know kingdom is looking to her and like could you you know what what are you gonna do and um i i i i I hear where you're coming from is there one particular mitzvah that means you know something a little more to you than the other mitzvahs hmm you're asking good questions here um i mean Shabbos is a very special mitzvah to me. It's just, I mean, I think <laughs> I just talked about a bunch of different examples where I chose Shabbos over something that's also really important to me. But I just love that Shabbos is this opportunity. I think today more than ever, like I, I, I appreciate it so much, that chance to disconnect from everything and be so present with my family, with Hashem, and, and there's nothing like it. Like, it, it really does feel like a taste of Olam Haba in a certain way, like, and, and I, I, I love it. What's the worst advice someone has ever given to you? <laughs> I don't know. I tune out bad advice, and I tune out what people tell me that I don't think is relevant to me. Um, I, I, one thing comes to mind that I, I remember when I announced on Facebook, um, you know, that I was becoming a professional runner and I was leaving my job for Olami, like, she was like, some commenter wrote, like, be very careful because once you do something a little bit, you know, out of the norm, it's a very slippery slope. And now I appreciate her, like, care and concern for, like, my growth and well-being, but I really do think that we have to be confident in the decisions you make based on your guidance from your rub and your mentors if you take whatever everyone's telling you and everyone's like worries and concerns for you or like don't do that because it's a little bit different than what everyone else is doing like you won't have the chance to be you so like to me that is is not the best advice <laughs> yeah it's it's funny you say that i was literally just talking to someone else about this on i i did another interview this morning and it was this idea that like when you're in the public light a lot of people have a lot of things to say. Whether it's coming from a good place or not, I don't know. But it's it's like what you're saying. It is so important to like, like you said, you got to speak to your Rav. You got to speak to the people in your life that you're actually close with. But you also got to like just block out a lot of things people are saying because it's, it's, it's I don't know, a lot of times it's just not, not really the right messages, you know? Yeah, even if I think about it now, you know, she said like, to me, it was coming from a place of fear. And I think I never want to live my life from a place of fear because fear is not a helpful emotion. It's It it holds us back. Like, I want to live my life or I'm choosing to do this because I believe this is right. And if you're constantly like, oh, no, I'm scared. I'm going to be doing the like I'm going down the wrong path. Like, that's not going to serve you well. So and yeah, definitely people when you're in a public eye, people are always going to comment on on things. And most of the time what they're saying doesn't, you know, really doesn't matter because they don't know your actual circumstances. So I, I saved you and my phone as when we were like, you know, chatting before. I, I saved you as Marathon Mother because in my head, that's how I, I, know, I know you as, not by your actual name. Do you identify more as a marathon runner or a mother? Um, I identify more as a mother. <laughs> and honestly, it's funny. I don't even... I don't really? really identify as marathon mother, even though that's like, like when people see me sometimes, it's like, oh, hi, there's marathon mother. Like it happens to be my Instagram account, but like I identify as my name, I guess. Um, I think as a mother, yeah, right. I remember that I was asked to speak on some panel and, and for women and it was about women who had stepping, stepped a little bit out of the line. And she asked me like, what's your greatest accomplishment that you're most proud of or something? Or what do you want to be remembered by? And I was like reviewing the questions before and I just thought that at the end of the day, like the thing I want to be remembered by is that my kid said, like, we had a really good mother who really cared about us. And I tell myself that all the time. Like, there is no one else in the world who's going to do this job of mothering your children except you. Everything else that you're doing, someone else can replace you. And like, no one is going to replace your role to your kids. And it's a hard thing to always remember when you're so public and so many people are giving you validation and positivity and feedback for all the amazing things you write on Instagram. And your kids are complaining to you and telling you they don't like supper and they don't want to go to bed. And it's so much easier to turn on your phone and just feel good from all those people instead of working really hard to be conscious and present and tune into, you know, what your kids need and 
give them that love, even though they don't always have the energy, you know, they're not always in the state and place to give it back to you. But like 20 years from now, they're going to develop into the people they can be because of everything you poured into them, you know? So that's what I, I mean, that's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's no question. That's, that's a really nice message. I love that. Um, so what advice, and we could, we could end off with this. What advice would you give to, I guess it's anyone watching, but I, in my head, I'm, I'm thinking particularly to women who, again, they're going with Das Torah, they're asking their love, but like they're scared to, to follow, I guess, they're, again, within Das Torah, but they're scared to follow their passion because they, you know what, it's, in life it's always easier at first to play the safe move, whether it's, you know, living in a certain area or getting a certain job. Like, when you're safe, it's, 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 there's less risk involved. Um, what advice would you give them to, 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 to know, to go and push and follow what you truly believe in and to follow in what your mission is in this, in this world? What, what advice would you give them? I don't know. It's funny. Sometimes I feel like on the one hand, everyone thinks I'm this person who is so great at, you know, having these huge dreams and pushing myself past my fears. And like, on the other hand, there are some things I really, I am that person that always likes to play it safe. Like when it comes to like, I have yet to invest any money in building my own brand and business. Cause like, I'm scared of investing things. I've made very like financially, whatever. I, I, I totally resonate with the fear of doing something that's a bit past our comfort zone or like I think what I saw with running is like when you're if you have something that you're really passionate about if you recognize a talent that you have or something you're good at you have an obligation to use it like it's not actually even really an option like you this is Hashem gave it to you and you have to run with it you have to figure out how you can use it to make a difference and practically I would say that you just need it like you just need to start with one small step. And when I have something that I'm scared of, like I, I, I don't think I can handle all of it. I say, OK, BD, what can you do right now that's going to get you closer to that goal you, of where you want to be? And if you're doing something every single day that's bringing you a little bit closer and you just break it down into the teeniest, tiniest baby steps, then it's manageable. Then it's less scary. Then it's, you know, you're moving in the right direction and always find people that believe in you and support you and want to help you, you know, become your best self, like maximize your potential. Find those people and just keep them in your life close to you. Well, Mrs. B.D. Deitch, thank you so much for bringing us, I get literally into your home. Well, not literally, but you're all invited kind of into your home. <laughs> I'll give you a tour of the Moshe. <laughs> we, yeah, okay, totally, totally. Um, but yeah, thank you. I, I, I definitely got a lot of chizik from this. And uh, I wish you a full Rufu Shlema. You should be able to run tomorrow morning. Amen, amen. That is my bracha. Thank you. It was really an uh, incredible opportunity to speak on your podcast. And you should have a lot of hatzlachah with all the podcasts you manage. <laughs> thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening or watching to this week's episode. Wasn't that fantastic? Isn't she incredible? I, I got a lot of chizik from her, and I still do. If you know someone that would love this show, but they don't have a smartphone, but they don't have internet, we have a phone number. We've had it actually for the past few months, and it's it's doing incredible. So many people that don't have access to internet, um, a lot of yeshiva guys, uh, seminary girls, or just people, a lot of people in Israel that just don't have internet are using the phone line. It's very easy. You call up the number in the show notes, whether you're in in america canada uh not canada well america canada um uk the uk or israel we have a separate number for each of them and you can call up and listen to any show from living the chaim so whether it's inspiration for the nation kosher money that's an issue spirit of song or charlene's podcast you could listen to any episode you can fast forward it's very easy and fun to use and go ahead and use the link in the show notes to get five bucks for 20% off and free shipping, the Tanoam series, you guys will love it. Check it out. I would say buy one, but that's dangerous. You got to buy five. You get money off with that deal. And also, you're going to finish one and be like, I need another. It's kind of addicting, so just warning. And um, get ready for next week's episode. I am very excited for who it's going to be. And you will find out very soon. Until next time, l'chaim. Living L'chaim.